Welcome to another episode of In the Name of Service, a podcast committed to sharing the untold stories of those who selflessly serve. Each episode features an interview with men and women who have been called to a variety of service-focused roles, such as the military, law enforcement, ministry, volunteering, and more. You aren't likely to know the names of the individuals you meet here, but our hope is by the end of our time together, you'll not only know their stories, but possibly be inspired to write your own in some way. Humble in nature, but strong in character, these everyday men and women showcase what it is to truly be a servant. We're glad you're here. Now here's your host, Dr. Barb Thompson. Welcome to episode six of the In the Name of Service podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Barb Thompson. Here we broadcast stories of men and women who've answered the call to serve in hopes of inspiring and catalyzing the rest of us to follow suit in our own way. Today's interview is with Steve Nisbet. Steve is a husband, father, special operations veteran, and the co-founder of Shields and Stripes, a nonprofit on mission to provide free, innovative, intensive, and holistic care for veterans and first responders. I had the great opportunity to work alongside Steve for a few years in our previous positions. He is driven, bright, thoughtful, and humble. His kindness in welcoming an outsider into the fold surprised me when I first arrived at the unit several years ago. He was even willing to share the turf with a slow girl and didn't even talk too much trash. In today's conversation, I was struck by several themes I believe are worth mentioning up front. If you've ever felt like life has brought you through a winding, twisted, and uncertain path, don't worry, you're in good company. Has anyone ever told you you're not good enough or you won't make it? Stay and listen. And if your life of service has exposed you to loss after loss, and you're wondering how to keep going, you need to hear Steve's story. Today, he courageously takes us through his greatest struggles, his journey towards health and wholeness, and how he's revolutionizing the treatment possibilities for veterans and first responders through intensive and holistic care. I hope this conversation offers you encouragement on your journey and that the fire to keep going that Steve talks about is fueled in you today. Thank you for listening. Okay, Steve, welcome to the In the Name of Service podcast. Start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background. Awesome. Thanks for having me. So a little bit about my boring life as I started (laughs) out. Um, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. I was born in Colorado. And I had two, well, I have two brothers. Grew up with two brothers. I'm a twin. And uh, throughout my entire childhood, you know, my main goal was playing soccer. Like that's that's all I did. I was played sports. I played all sports, but competitively I played soccer. So that was my passion as I started to go through school, um, enter into high school, and, and even looking at college. You know, with no real plan um, other than like my you know my dream was to play pro soccer. But in my high school, I mean, we weren't very good. And there was no, uh, there's like no scouts coming out to look at San Rita High School. Yeah. Like, pick me <laughs> up, and be like that's the guy. And uh, I didn't grow up, um, certainly not poor, but, but not rich, so like, you know, lower middle class. And um, so we couldn't afford like travel ball. Like all my friends were doing travel soccer and things like that. And, you know, couldn't afford um, a lot of things. And so I just did what I could um, with what I had. And then as I started to approach high school and, and graduating high school, the the, uh, the question of what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with your life kind of came up. And and I also really enjoyed space. I was a, I'm a, I am a space nerd. I like, um, enjoy astronomy and things like that. Um, so I'm sure your listeners that are my friends will get to hear that. <laughs> They're like, oh, here he goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So that's what I wanted to do. And so, so I was like, okay, well, if soccer's not a thing, I'll just go do this space thing. The, the community college, because I didn't get scholarships to go to a university, it was too expensive for my parents to pay for it, and I couldn't afford it with my $5.15 an hour job. So I guess I'll go to community college and uh, give astronomy a try. And as I entered into my first year, I looked around at the people around me, 
and most of them were like in their 60s and 70s or maybe maybe 50s and 60s but there's a lot of old folk around me and i was like wow i am like the only 19 year old here in this class and i feel really out of place and like there's a lot more i could be doing with my life and my dad he uh he spent four years in the Air Force as a security forces uh, officer. And then he got out of that and then became a police officer. So he spent 30 years in law enforcement. So when I was trying to figure out the next step, that's what kind of pushed me towards, all right, I'll, I'll just join the military because my dad you know, had a good experience there. And then um, just moved from there. Yeah, so initially you were looking for something to fill the void. The Air Force was something that you had seen. Yeah, just the military in general. Like I didn't know what, what um, I didn't know what direction I wanted to go. I just knew that like all my friends went to the you know, went to University of Arizona or like other ones, and I was like the one kid that was like looking at all those friends, kind of like, having goals and ambitions, and they were pursuing those. And yeah, and I was like, man, I suck. Like, I. I have nothing going on for me right now, and I got nowhere to go. So once you uh, decided to join the Air Force, was there some kind of way that you made the decision to pursue the particular career field that you ended up pursuing? Yeah, so I went um, I went to a recruiter's office. And my grandfather also spent uh, time in the Air Force as well. And so I would say like, that was in my family and I was like you know what like that's that's the direction I want to go I don't really want to go in the army um that like that was the air force was like, on my mind so I went to the recruiter's office and um took took the ASVAB test and I scored really really well on those uh, on that test and all the different categories there and they're like hey you can do pretty much anything you want to do in the air force and I was like what's the most challenging job <laughs> that you have to have um that, that you have to have a high score for really, high intelligence for it and not that I'm intelligent, but according to my ASVAB scores, I, well, I was. And uh, and they're like, had a nuclear weapons apprentice. And I was like, that sounds pretty, that sounds pretty wild. And my buddies were going to school to become engineers, and they had plans to work at IBM and Raytheon. And I was like, man, if I can do this nuclear weapons apprentice, and I learn about, you know, weapons systems and whatnot, maybe I can meet them. Maybe I can you know, use, use the some TAs and tuition assistance and some GI Bill and I'll, and I'll just go meet them back at the university and, and I'll have this knowledge, right? Yeah. And uh, so I was like, sign me up, sign me up for a nuclear weapons apprentice. And I was ready to go sign some paperwork. And that was the plan was to do this for four years and then go to school after that for the GI Bill and then meet up with my old pals and just like, be a be a team again and uh such a neat little package you had that wrapped up into <laughs> yeah I, exactly my, <laughs> my brain was like problem solved everything's good to go and so i stepped out of that recruiter's office and next door is an army recruiter and he was standing outside and he's like hey son and i was like excuse me and he's like hey come over here and i was like i'm gonna i'm i just signed paperwork with the air force man i don't i don't think you can sell me anything right now and he's like you want to be in special forces and i was like well, dang, well, I've never <laughs> thought of that. Like, I, have, I have never considered that because I'm not special. Like I was like, you know, 120 pounds, 230 pounds soaking wet, like not a big dude, and not super confident in myself. And I was like, let me hear what you have to say. And so he's like, yeah, you sign up six years, get you a $20,000 signing bonus. And you could be a Green Beret or a Ranger, this and that. And I was like, man, that sounds pretty wild. Hang on a second. And I went back into the Air Force recruiting office and I was like, hey, do you guys have uh, special forces career fields or anything like that? And they're like, yeah, but man, you just signed up for a nuclear weapons apprentice. Just go with that. And I was like, well, what what, what are the jobs? And he's like, well, okay, it's combat control and pararescue. And I was like, can you get any information on that? And he's like, here, yeah, you can take this, but let me tell you, like, you're not going to make it. Wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, cool, thanks. <laughs> um, and so he's like, yeah, you're not going to make it, man. It's it's a 90% attrition rate. You know, only one out of 10 people make it. Um, and you're just, you're just better off to just go with what you have right now. And I was like, well, kind of, I want to make that decision myself. Um, and I looked at that at the information he gave me and spent a couple of days and I came back and I was like, I want to be a combat controller. 
and uh, so I, that's what I started training for. Okay. Become a combat controller, right? And uh, as I was training, because medicine just wasn't like, I was like, that sounds like a lot that I don't want to do. Like, was, <laughs> like it sounds a lot easier to just like, you know, control combat, whatever that meant. Cause I didn't really know what that meant. Of course, but, yeah. And, and I was like, that sounds just more interesting. And, uh, and so I was training and then I went to take the pass test, the, the physical ability and stamina test. And they're like, all right, which one are you gonna take? Uh, and I was like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, one has a swim at the beginning, one has a swim at the end. I was like, well, I've been training to do the, the swim at the end. Um, and so I was like, I'll just do that. And they're like, okay, you're gonna be a PJ. And I was like, hold on a second. I thought I was signing up to be a controller. They're like, yeah, when you get to basic training, you can, it's the same thing. You'll figure it out. You know, they'll put you, you know, you just tell them there and they'll put you in the same spot. And at that moment, at that time, the PJs and controllers were going through in dock at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I believed this man. And I was like, okay, this guy wouldn't lie to me. And uh, so I took the test and then he's like, all right, cool, you're, you're ready to go. And so I got in and then showed up to Indoc and, and they're like, all right, you're just, you're gonna be a P, all you guys are gonna try to be PJs. And I was like, well, that's me a controller. And they're like, nope, this is a PJ class. And I was like, sweet. Wow. What is that about? And uh, and then so I just started learning more and and then uh, just fell into into doing this and, and, and this was happened to be the right path for me. Isn't that funny? I never knew that about your story. I mean, I met you, you were a PJ. It seemed like the perfect fit. So I had no idea <laughs> yeah. the tumultuous beginning. Yeah, so I give controllers a hard time, but deep down I'm a controller inside. <laughs> oh, that you know that's what they want to hear too. That's it, yeah, it's, I'm just better looking than most of them. <laughs> <laughs> How did you make the decision to keep pushing in that direction? When I met you, you were at the most elite, you know, ground force unit in the Air Force and that doesn't take just a little bit of effort uh, yeah so I went to NDOC and I actually at, at basic training um, this, be, this became a theme was there was probably like 35 other dudes in the class that were trying to become PJs in, in, my, in my basic training class uh, and so as I'm doing as we're doing whatever you know basic training just rolling socks and marching around in circles um i would go to sleep at night at like 9 p.m or whenever it's time to shut down and, and wake up at three in the morning well everybody else that's trying to become a pj is sitting there doing push-ups and pull-ups and like working out extra and i was like god dang i'm tired right i'm going to sleep and uh and the ti and the training instructor is like hey uh, Nesby, come over here and, uh, and stand in front of them. And he's like, look, at you see all those guys over there? Those are the guys that are going to make it. You're not going to be, you're not going to make it. You're going to be the one to quit because they're putting in the extra work and whatnot. I was like, well, I guess I get like, I, I'm still like, I'm like, I can talk back to him. But I was like, I don't know. Maybe he's right, but this guy also doesn't know me at all. But lo and behold, we go through Indoc, and of those 35 other folks, I was the only one to finish. All of the other ones quit. Goodness. And, yeah, and so it just goes back to show, like, you know, even though somebody can tell me that I, I'm not going to make it, and just like that guy, uh, the recruiter, and this TI, this training instructor, like, I was part of me pushing through was just people kept telling me I can't do it. You know, you, you, you're not going to be able to make it. I was still 130 pounds, uh, but I, I, I guess I had the fire to continue to keep going. And, and as I continued throughout the career, like, I finished our apprentice course, PJ University or whatever, PJU. I finished that and I only had the intent to really go to, to rescue, like a rescue squadron. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I want to do like a rescue squadron. Like, I, I still didn't feel like I was aggressive enough or like confident enough to, to really get into combat, you know, mm -hmm. like really get into to some firefights. So I was like, what interested me it was like doing rescues, like civilian rescues. Like that was, I don't know, at that time, that's that felt like the right answer for me to oh, one of the reasons why I got in I'm like I want to help other people yeah and then uh, I was going to go to a rescue squadron and then I ended up a slot I ended up opening up at an ST squadron out in Okinawa and uh, when that slot opened up um, they took like, the top four dudes of those classes and then I think I was ranked number four in the class 
And so I went to the ST squadron in Oki and I was like, well, I guess we'll see how this goes. And, uh, and then I ended up deploying, um, augmenting 24th and, um, had a mixed experience, but that kind of pushed me in the direction of like, okay, maybe, maybe I do want to get involved in some, some combat action. Cause I'm watching these guys go, um, assault targets and, and I got to treat some folks and, and got to do some pretty cool things overseas. And I was like, wow, that was that adrenaline rush really got me going. And, uh, and so I just kept I was like, I'll re-enlist and see what this is about one more time. Yeah. And, and then I went to Nellis and really Kazavak at the rescue squadrons picked up. And some guys are overseas doing a lot of point of injury um, rescues, going out to you know, IED sites or whatever. And we run like six missions a day. And so I go out and do a couple of those deployments and, and just really got some, some really good PJ experience. And I was like, that was really a, like fulfilling that was really addicting to to get out there and you know engage get engaged at and and pull these americans or these coalition forces off the battlefield and, and do do our best to to get into a higher level of care what do you think has been your most meaningful experience during your air force career that was a that was a, that was a tough one that was a one i kind of thought about for a little while but the me- most meaningful experience I mean, there's a cliche um, of the teamwork, right? Yeah. The team, the team that I'm that I'm around, the, the caliber of individuals that that are around me, and uh, the team that I got to lead. Uh, had a really meaningful experience leading those teams, and and it it did mean a lot to me that I was to be a team leader, and and not just like manage folks, but. Uh, to to really do my best to lead them and make sure that that they're taken care of and, that, and I'm doing the best I could. But I guess a couple I'm going to give a couple answers here. Yeah. One of them was in one of the deployments. Um, I think it was 2012. Um, we typically overseas, like work and rescue, you you pick up a, a casualty or pick up some you know, somebody and and you bring them back. And you don't really get like the closure. You don't get what happened next after that. You mm-hmm. get, uh, they get to the hospital and it's like, oh, I, wonder, I wonder how they're doing. Well, um, one particular instance, there was a uh, New Zealand uh, team that was up in northern Afghanistan, and they got hit with an IED, and they called you know a nine line in, and this was more like a PR, like a personal rescue mission, rather than like a, a Kazakh and. So they, so those go directly to us. So for me to see that as a team leader, I knew that these people wanted wanted PJs. They didn't want uh, dust off or, or army medics. They, they were specifically asking for PJs to show up there. And so that was there was a unique request from these folks. And so as we showed up, it was an IED, a soft skin um, Humvee and pretty much completely obliterated and it was a command detonated and so we helped them recover the bodies of these three new zealanders and put them in, in body bags and uh, get them on the helicopter on the, on the helicopter to take them back and you know one of the decisions i made or or asked um because typically we carry american flags to put on the body bags of our, of our fallen mm-hmm. and so i asked the pilots hey can we call their base and go pick up some flags, some New Zealander flags and pin it on these body bags. Well, and then we'll take these, take their bodies to, to Bagram and uh, do the mortuary affairs process. And so that we flew there and landed and pretty much their entire team and their command staff was there waiting. Hmm. Um, and so they had their flags and we let them help pin the flags on and watch them say their goodbyes to, to their teammates and they're fallen. And uh, it was a very, you know, humbling process. And and I'm thankful that I was able to provide that for them. Right. And, and then was able to take off and fly back to Bagram and, and give them the full services. Well, then a week later, I was able to see, uh, they posted a video of they being, the New Zealanders posted a video of these three fallen returning home and it's uh but it's pretty much the entire regiment um and the three hearses pulling down their down a driveway 
and the entire regiment's kind of walking towards them and they start doing the haka, which is their their uh, traditional dance, uh, a weir's dance, uh, and, and doing it towards the, the fallen um, as they start to you know, go through the, through the funeral process and whatnot. So that, for me, right there was the first time I got to watch, you know, from from point of entry or point of call right. to go pick them up, to go take them to, you know, friends and families, and then see what happened at the very end. Yeah. Uh, so that that was very, well, that that stuck with me for a long period of time. I mean, I was just still that stick with me um, because very few times do I get that to see that. Um, and then the, the other meaningful experience for two, one is that, you know, my family was able to stick with me through you know, 16 years of, of deploying you know, 10 times and TDYs and you know, the emotional roller coasters that, that we've been on. Um, that's been, you know, very meaningful that you know, I can become a statistic with the service that we, we've gone through. And then the, I think the most meaningful experience I had was after Peter's accident was the team that, uh, that formed around us yeah. and, and more so me knowing that I blamed myself uh, quite a bit and I was hoping, well, you know, back then I wanted, I wanted everybody to blame me. Um, I, I wanted them to hate me and when they didn't, when they, when they kind of rallied up around me and supported me and were there for me every step of the way and kept me from going down a pathway of darkness that mm -hmm. that was obviously changed my perspective of, of how I viewed myself and how I viewed everything. So that was very meaningful to me. Thank you for being courageous and sharing that with us. Would you say that was your most difficult experience during your Air Force service? Yeah, I would say that that's that was the most difficult was was Peter's loss, um, it, and it was uh, the culminating of of all the losses. So, you know, I I uh, at Indoc, you know, two thousand five, going through Indoc. And uh, Indoc is the course that, you know, or was the course that uh, PJs and controllers would go through, or now the PJs and then now it's ANS. Indoc was kind of the, the selection game. That was a weeding out. Right. And it, was, and it was all, it was 12 weeks of, you know, just suck, of just survive. Right. As long as you could. And uh, that's where the 90% comes from. And what my recruiter was talking about was, you know, only one out of 10 people make it well, because most people are quitting in the pool or even more so in the morning because they're so anxious about what's going to happen in the day. The unknown. It's like, yeah. It's, yeah. Like we're just not going to. So you'd see lines of people, um, candidates or whatever, standing outside in their blues and like, geez, you know, like I, that never went through my head of, of doing that. And so, but during my in-doc course, was the ex first experience of loss, um, and so my uh, the team leader, the, the, the team commander, uh, my induct team, Major Brian Adrian, he he was my you know pretty much my buddy throughout our hell night. You had to partner up, and so him and I were, were together for like, you know thirty six hours, and uh, on the fifth week or so, um, we ended up having like a really gnarly pool session, and. A pretty gnarly underwater um, experience, and he passed out, which is common right. um, for us. But he was also 42 or 43 years old to go through this. And uh, looking back now, you can see his physical decline, and he ended up having a heart condition that that he didn't know about it. You know, nobody really knew about. And he had going into cardiac arrest at the bottom of the pool, and they pulled him out, did CPR on him. I worked on them for a little bit, and they came back, and they got to the hospital, and ended up passing away. So, at Indoc was my first experience of loss, uh, and then go to my deployment, you know, the, the one where I was augmenting, mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a very heavy year. 2010 was a was a big loss uh, year for for the U.S. You know, and, and part of that loss was. A couple of friends that I made um, on that uh, particular deployment, the train up, um, 
you know, one in particular was a ranger. We'd been playing some Call of Duty, you know, one night and uh, went out on, on an op. And, you know, this this also sticks with me is, you know, I was, I was really working him up in this video game. And I said, <laughs> I'm not tactically like this in real life, like you are in this video game or you're going to just get smoked. And, and that night he ended up getting killed. Mm. And, uh, and so that's always stuck with me. And so that theme of loss throughout my life, and, and I never processed any of that, you know, like a couple guys that were close to me um, in accidents and you know, killing themselves or you know, just deaths in combat or crashes. Uh, so the, that's, I never processed any of that. Like yeah. I never, I never sat and thought about it, and I, and I just continued to work and work and work. And when Peter's accident happened, it was like a flood of not just his loss and me feeling responsible for his loss, but every single loss that I've ever had kind of boiled up to that point. And uh, it was all at once. It was happening all at once. And so I think that, yeah, that processing emotionally was the most difficult uh, part of my career. And then... You know, the, when I did, when the investigation closed out and and I was removed from the unit, that was the second most difficult part, but also the most freeing at the mm. same time. Wow. And then, and then I'd say the third most difficult part was actually getting to the unit itself and going through selection because that was heinous. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was awful. Yeah. Tell us about your decision to separate and pursue another form of service how did that come about yeah so like i alluded to was was after the investigation closed out and you know the the ramifications of what happened you know recognizing that there wasn't anything that we did wrong um but they needed to hold somebody accountable for the loss of life um, and so i was and actually held accountable as a team leader and were removed from the unit and like that, like I said, it was, it was, it was a very difficult because this is the place I wanted to be. Right. Um, and this is what I like, worked really hard for. And it was also freeing of like, now I know what to do next. It was like, there was like, finally I have the answer an answer rather than kind of sit in this limbo. So I was given, you know, like, a weekend to, to kind of make a decision on where I wanted to get next and I thought about going to a different unit and where I wanted to go ultimately came back and and uh, just with all the loss and losing a lot of the resources that I had used um, there at the unit like all, all the human performance staff I, uh, I was just pursued the medical retirement mm-hmm. and and you know, that was the, the safest answer for me because if I was I was given really about a month to to pretty much like hey you you have to PCS as fast as possible out of this unit and so uh, the next unit that they were going to give me was Vegas and I had already been there and that had been challenging for my family right and I knew in the state that I was in mentally having just been fired and lost a teammate and, and you know, my life completely getting turned upside down you know as far as the career goes I'm going to show up to this unit with no deployments to do like I'm, people aren't going to understand why I'm even here and uh, I'm going to be in Vegas where I pretty much almost lost my entire family um, years before and I knew that pathway was not a good one. Mm-hmm. It was not going to result in, in a positive outcome for me and my family. So I was like, I, I can't do that. I'm going to pursue a medical retirement and get out. And I didn't really have a plan. I just knew that that wasn't wasn't it. Right. That, that was not going to be it. Uh, so choosing to get out, um, and I just asked them, "Hey, can you guys let me figure out what I'm going to do next?" And this, there was no skills bridge process at that moment but there was a uh, an internship program uh, similar to that or what it became and so I started pursuing an internship with Exos um, which is a pro performance institute that typically works with professional athletes and uh, and then since then it just kind of took off into what it is now tell us about shields and stripes yeah so I uh, I knew when I started my process of getting out that ultimately those resources 
and the the HP staff with all the strength conditioning coaches and nutrition and and physical therapists and the psychologists I had those not been at my fingertips I would not be where I am today like I don't know where I would if I didn't have somebody there to lean on and with all these questions and get these answers I don't know where that would have ended up because after Peter's accident there was there was a psychologist that showed up and uh, you know but she's like, hey, if there's anyone you want to talk to, like, here's, here's, we're here for you. And, you know, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> That's the first thing I want. Like, right. this, lady, this lady has no clue who we even are, you know, or what we're doing out here. And, uh, and she may have been like the best psychologist world renowned. I don't know. Um, but right then I didn't like, I still wouldn't want to talk to her because I don't know that person. Yeah. Uh, I know the people that were embedded within the unit and I want to talk to those folks who understand what we're going through and, and what's expected of us. So I knew I was going to lose those and, and I was going to be stuck to the VA system. And I was like, man, there's got to be another way. And mm-hmm. So I did a lot of research. I Googled a lot of like, who's in this space outside of the military, who's in the human performance space and, and are these services already offered somewhere? And there really wasn't, like you got Warrior's Heart and a couple other organizations, but not a lot of them do like a very- Holistic. Uh, holistic, yeah, all all body, like health, physical health, mental health, like all together. Nobody's doing that uh, for a long period of time. And so I was like, all right, I guess, like I'll start that up in 2023 or 2024. And so that was my plan was to get a student. <laughs> As this is also a theme of my life. I just have these plans and then they change. And so, yeah, that was my plan. I was going to go to school. I'm going to learn about business because I'm, you know, uh, just a lowly PJ that like, doesn't really know much about you know, nothing about business. And uh, I'm going to learn about it. And then I'm going to start it up. And it's just going to be like smooth sailing. It's going to be sweet. And so I was doing this internship with Exos going to school and then at the end of it at the end of the internship I was like hey is there going to be a job and uh, the guy was interning uh, love the guy and he's like not really <laughs> <laughs> and I was like great okay. yeah I was like so what do I do and he's like you have to start um, what you said you're going to do you have to do what you said you're going to do just start it and I was like okay I get it where do I how do I do that and like I get people say this, you know, the, the old cliche, like, you just got to start moving. Okay, where is that? Like, is there a building I go to? Just one step at a time, Steve. Just- <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Just one step at a time. Like, no, I need to know physically, like, is there a phone number I call to start this? Like, and he's like, oh, yeah, I just go to LegalZoom. And I was like, okay, I'll go to LegalZoom. And so I went on to LegalZoom and I filed for an LLC. And I was like, damn, there it is. And I started doing some research and, uh, and made some phone calls and they're like, so do you want this to be like a regular business or a nonprofit? And I was like, well, a nonprofit because it's gonna be hard for people to pay out of their pocket. Like, okay, so you don't want an LLC, you want a 501c3. And I was like, can't you just turn an LLC to a 501c? And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. And so it goes to show that I didn't know anything about business. And uh, so I was like, okay, uh, back to legal zoom I go. I dissolved that that LLC, ate about $800. Um, and then started up the 501c3. And, you know, just started meeting people and, and asking if they can help out. And, and uh, essentially, the goal to replicate what we had there at the unit. Yeah. Uh, because if, if I didn't have those resources and if only I had the psychologist that showed up at, the, at Peter's accident, I would push away just about every single person right. that's offering me help. So there are thousands and thousands of first responders and veterans that don't have the access that we have within special operations. And I wanted to make sure that we could be that trusted agent, that trusted access to them, of people that offering them the services that we know work. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I started it up of, of really just an idea and going to LegalZoom and, and asking uh, my co-founder, Dr. Jennifer Byrne, and like, hey, will you uh, help me in this cause? And really, when I first met her, she was kind of giving me tips and tricks of like, here, this is what you need to do. And I was like, hey, Jen, like, 
I need you to like are you willing to just join me like instead of just giving me tips like I need help and uh, and so she joined up and so so now it's you know been operating operating for a year and a half almost two years now and uh, grown significantly and you guys are going through is it your fourth cohort now yes yeah, so our fourth starts in march um and so our the way we started it was that we knew that this process worked but we had to convince and this is kind of the hardest part of nonprofits altogether is convincing people to give you money for nothing in return right you get, yeah. you get nothing and you know other than a feel good mm -hmm. you know, tax write-off and and maybe that'll benefit you in, in tax season but other than that like there is no product you're getting there's nothing you're getting out of it other than like you trust me to do good with your money um and that's a hard that's so hard and, and it's hard to ask people to to do that to but now you've put real people through these cohorts. It's making a real difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm seeing people at the end come out and, and talking about their experience and then, and really just kind of spreading that message. And I believe helping others because they know how they've been helped. But what have you personally learned about healing by essentially setting up these holistic services to help others heal? Um, I, I learned everybody heals, I guess, in, in a different way. Um, the trauma overall affects the entire body, you know? Yeah. And so healing has to be not just the mind, it has to be the entire body. Mm -hmm. Nutrition, physical injury, everything you can think of physically and mentally has to be working cohesively all together. So that's the most important thing and to reset the body and the mind in one space uh, has, has proven for the longevity of a healer. What do you think is the greatest need in that space that you've seen so far? Yeah, so the, the biggest need, I think, is more of these, um, whether that's other people starting their own, mm -hmm. or contributing to help us start more of these, that we, we want to be able to run 12 a year. We can only afford to run two a year right now. Okay. Um, essentially, there's too many other organizations and, and, and you know, different representatives that want to commit money to it. It's just like bandages, like short-term stuff. Like, hey, yeah, like that's a two two day or three day workshop, and this is going to solve all your problems. Well, no, it's not. Like this, it's going to take a long time, and we need, I guess, people that that are have ability to help support programs like this to understand that it takes longer than two to three days. It actually takes like three months, you know, or more more so like a year. Right. To, to get through some of these traumas and it's continuous. And these three day workshops are great, but you know, they can produce numbers and say, this is the thousands of people we helped. But at the end of the day, that didn't really change their life. That just, you know, like kind of put a bandaid on a, on a hemorrhage. Is there any, I, I really like that, that specific goal of 12 per year versus the two. What would that take? Is it, does it take more money, Steve, or is it something else? Yeah, so like our, our greatest limitation right now is just funding. Okay. Um, and so you know, just to give people a, a sense or an idea, it's, it costs about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to put somebody through this. Okay. And uh, and so total about one hundred and twenty, hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that's with none of the staff. It's an all volunteer staff right now, and and they're working full time, and, and they deserve to be working this as a full-time job so it costs a tremendous amount of money but it's also worth that tremendous amount of money because yes i can tell you quite a few of these folks that have already gone through it have had previous attempts right taking their own lives um, right and they all have families and so not you're not just affecting the individual and you're affecting the family and friends so typically if you think you're affecting one person you're actually affecting like about 150 right people. that's so um, true so that are connected to that individual so the amount of money to invest in you know, these eight people is you know dropping the bucket compared to what what the outcome is the positive outcome is so ultimately hopefully we can raise you know five million dollars annually to be able to, to support the tour cohorts a year and that's the goal is to get you know 100 people a year we have several of these exos facilities that uh, work available to us to use 
awesome. And, uh, and we, we don't want to have a shortage. There's a lot of people that want to volunteer. Um, it's, there's a lot of, you know, clinical professionals that want to help out. It's just being able to pay them for their services and get, you know, get these people there. And the demand is high. We just had a newsletter to get produced by the, the VA or put out by the VA. And that produced Floodgate. a, oh a my huge gosh. demand that we were not prepared for. Not that they, we, I don't want to say that we weren't prepared for, but being able to take this stack of applications and put it on a congressman's desk or, or a rep- representative desk and say, these are the people like these are the people that are having a hard time right already seeking services yeah. and it's not enough yeah exactly right and at this rate you know, it's going to take 10 years to see all of them but that's unacceptable help us you know be able to see all of them in one year if we could have them if we had the funding that we that we need we could see all of them this year rather than all of them in 10 years wow so that's that's the change that could that could potentially happen here and we were seeing i mean we've only been up for a year and a half right um, and so we've seen some some serious growth um, but there's the demand is so high that it needs to happen faster fast, yeah uh, fast well, if there is someone out there that feels a call to serve in, in any capacity, in their own unique way, what's your advice for them? Like where, where, or how do they get started? Let's start with you. Um, with us, yeah, we have our website and we have a contact email that goes to us and they can email and say, hey, how, how can I help out? Okay. Um, there's various social media profiles that we have. Um, we have folks that manage the Instagram and LinkedIn profiles and they're welcome to uh, message message us on there and, and we'll find spots for them. And I'm always open to, to have volunteers or if folks want to set up a fundraising opportunity or come help with a booth set up or read what we're doing somehow or just figure it out. If they don't know what it is that they want, that we can help them figure it out. Right. We're always welcome to, to entertain those, those opportunities. Awesome. In general, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. In general, you know, I get asked actually quite a bit. Like, I, I don't know anything about business, and and I'm learning. It's a steep learning curve every day. That I have different types of meetings um, with folks that have been in the business realm forever. But the understanding the need and the passion. Like, mm-hmm. I think a lot of folks get out of um, the service, and then they go straight into a job, and because. The, the money is what kind of motivates them to get into that. But the whole reason they got into the military was the service part. Yeah. And feeling like they're part of helping somebody. Like they, they, they showed up for a mission, for a cause. They, they joined because they wanted to be serving for a cause that they believed in. And once they get out and they're working in a, in a regular nine to five job, that, that, a passion for serving it doesn't die it's just now they want to serve they want to continue to serve so i would encourage them to continue to explore that i think that's what a lot of depression comes from is losing that ability of like that that fire of serving uh, when they enter into this other job so yeah. I, would, I would encourage them to explore what that means to them and if, if service you know can, it's only like being able to financially do it at this time like supporting a nonprofit or uh, maybe it's not financially maybe it's you know offered as a volunteer in some way you know maybe at a weekend or something like that for those opportunities or if it's prayers if they're religious folks just pray and, and that's a, a form of service yeah and then if they want to really jump into the deep end um, I guess I'd proof that you just gotta persevere and not listen to those demons that tell you you can't because there's a lot of people that want to see you fail and it's up to you to, to rise to the occasion and prove that you won't and has the theme continued have you been told you won't make it oh yes <laughs> <laughs> when I first like I said I did the research yeah wanting to explore this and I called up like 10 different organizations and nonprofits, and of those 10 only one really was like I will help you wow yeah. Yeah, you've been told you won't make it before. Yeah. It's no so, big deal. It's fuel for your fire. That's exactly it. Yeah, so the one organization that, that like really, and I, I, I'd like to give a props because they believed and, and I you know, value his, his friendship um, and his mentorship is, is Big Sky Bravery. So yeah. McCain. And uh, he really helped me and Jen just like formulate thoughts and plans and focus ideas on how do we start this, you know, the 
those those very few people that are believers are the ones that I paid you know, all the attention to and they so Josh is somebody I respect so I care what he the input he gave yeah it's so important I, just for people to hear a lot of us uh, run into what can be perceived as brick walls but there's tools to make it through that oh yeah absolutely well i've kept you far too long but <laughs> i really appreciate your time and uh, your willingness to uh just be courageous to talk about yourself and your experience with us today oh, thank you for having me it's good catching up everybody. Thank you for joining us for another incredible episode of In the Name of Service. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like and subscribe. And of course, feel free to share with those you feel would like to be inspired. Have a difference maker in your life that you'd like to see featured? Reach out to Dr. Barb Thompson at in the name of service at gmail.com. We'll see you next time.